Here is Scotty. Scotty. Couldn't be anywhere. Jason, we're voting in the house. What's up, brother? We are going to do things in an interesting way. Okay? <laughs> First time for everything. That's right. We're going to try again. Yeah! Right. We're going to begin with the cue. Are we good? Oh, we're going to go Well, it was a pleasure to entertain you for about four minutes. That's good. All right, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand this over to the host with the most, Brian Ludden. Give him a few more Thank you, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for showing up. This is the Super Duper Star Trek panel. If you're looking for the Star Wars panel, it's not happening. What? Sorry. All right, so we have some really great guys for you today. Uh, we've got some uh, stuff to get through for you uh, with some uh, photographic evidence of what these guys do. And we're going to talk about um, uh, their adventures with Star Trek and making it for you. I'm sure it's going to be wildly entertaining. So uh, the first guy uh, I wanted to start out with um, was, uh, let's see, uh, this guy here, Darren Gockman. Should we take a hand for Darren? Darren is, is one of the people responsible for the fantastic new uh, Star Trek uh, Director's Cup 4K. He's got Paragon Plus. But how many people here have seen the new version of it? Doesn't it make the movie so much better? Yes. I mean, it's just wonderful. So, Jen, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Do you have any slides to show today? I don't have any slides. I just have my wonderful voice to guide you along this journey. Um, I, I, I uh, have always been a Star Trek fan since I was tiny. Uh, I started with the uh, animated series, and then about uh, two months later, discovered that there was a live action series uh, at the same time, and I was uh, quite uh, befuddled and uh, amused. Um, but uh, I've been a, a, a Trekkie for uh, forever. And when I saw the original Star Trek The Motion Picture on December 7th, 1941, uh, 1979, uh, I was enthralled, I loved it, uh, and I always thought that it was this, the greatest thing ever. And then I realized that there was a lot missing, and there, that it was never finished, and that uh, the great Robert Wise was really pissed off at the studio because he needed another several weeks of post-production to uh, tighten everything up. And uh, back in uh, probably around 1998, uh, my partners and I, David Fine and uh, Michael Madicino, and I uh, approached Robert Wise about the question of, you know, what would you have done with those extra weeks of post-production? And uh, we uh, were able to get a print of the film and showed it to him at the Director's Guild. And uh, after looking at that, we sat around and we thought, you know what? Uh, he said, well, maybe we can do something with this. Because he hadn't talked about it or seen it in 18 years at that point. Uh, so um, the thing was that uh, he uh, initiated the letter to uh, uh, Sherry Lansing of Paramount and said, how would you guys feel about me revisiting this project? And they said, absolutely, we give you our full support on home video, uh, which was fine. You know, it, it, it's how they worked, because they were making their money from uh, DVDs at the time. And so we got the budget to do it for DVD. And we worked with Robert Wise for uh, uh, several months, and our uh, crew doing uh, visual effects and uh, all sorts of stuff. And we, uh, got the edit together the way he liked it, and he uh, he was with us at every cut. And he said, "Well, I want to I want to do some things here. I'm going to switch some things around a little bit. I'm going to tighten it up, and uh, you know, really uh, focus more on the character moments that we had to cut out back in '79 because there was no time. Uh, and among those was the famous section of uh, Spot crying uh, for us." but for V'ger, uh, and that was one of the reasons why Leonard Nimoy was so angry when he saw the theatrical release, because that whole section had been cut out, and he didn't know. Uh, and so Nimoy bashed the movie for years after that. Uh, and, you know, 
not necessarily unfairly, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, and so, uh, at the end of this project, we, we sort of, uh, uh, working with uh, Robert Wise, establishing the new cut uh, to create the director's edition, uh, we uh, found that we needed about uh, close to 90 visual effects shots to uh, flush the thing out, to make it consistent, and to fill in some gaps, and make it play like one uh, good movie again. Uh, so uh, we were able to do that within the budget that Paramount provided, and uh, it was released in 2001, uh, an appropriate number of year. Uh, and uh, this was right after the uh, uh, September 11th uh, tragedy, and uh, but it was released in September or November of 2001, and uh, it, it did really well. The studio was very surprised because I think they told us at one point it was a dead franchise. Uh, so uh, we we're very happy about the response to that. And, uh, but the problem is that we'd always wanted to go to full film resolution. Uh, and we did everything we could at the time to prepare for that eventuality. We didn't know that it would come 22 years later, uh, which is kind of funny, but uh, after uh, persevering and, uh, and keeping the flame lit as much as we could, uh, finally the edict came down that Paramount was indeed uh, offering us the opportunity to revisit this, and thanks to the wonderful uh, uh, Paramount Plus, they paid for the party with their dearest blood. Uh, well, okay, just, just the budget. No blood was spilled. Uh, and the great thing was that uh, we, the, the great thing was at the, at the time, in 2000, we wouldn't have been able to do as good a job as we did this time. Because not only had the technology advanced, but our skills had advanced, and the ability to find all the wonderful original elements from the original movie in 65 millimeter and Vista Vision, and be able to scan those and combine them, composite them digitally, uh, to make them look uh, amazing, uh, better than they ever had. And the, uh, the wonderful people at the uh, Paramount Archives helped us find as learn all that was learnable, to find all that was scannable, and uh, they, they did it, and they really did an amazing uh, job finding this stuff for us, and, uh, and we were able to take all this stuff, we were able to get a bunch of our original crew back, uh, we, uh, we called it the Reserve Activation Clause, and uh, we, we, we uh, basically drafted them into service again, and uh, it was really great. This time, uh, because of, of course of the wonderful pandemic, we all were working from home, and that brought some uh, interesting challenges because everyone was in a different place, in different countries, in different time zones, and it was uh, a really a, a lot of different challenges this time. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you're planning on uh, doing heavy transfers of uh, full resolution uh, film, uh, each frame is 82 megabytes each frame, and uh, there's a lot of long shots in Star Trek The Motion Picture, and they take forever to transfer over the internet. So, uh, which means it's good for uh, avoiding bootlegs, but, uh, but when you're making the movie again, it's kind of difficult. So that was the main challenge on the project, but uh, everything else went great. We have a, a wonderful new sound mix, uh, uh, Bruce Botnick, the original uh, uh, engineer on the uh, soundtrack recording back in the day, uh, he came back and he completely took the original stems and the original uh, master tapes and remixed the music for us in Atmos, and it sounds amazing on its own. And when we combine that with the new sound mix, the Atmos sound mix that you will get uh, when you uh, buy the uh, physical media that is coming out in September, um, Thank you. Uh, in, in, for, in glorious 4K and uh, full Dolby Atmos, it's, uh, it's astounding. Uh, the job that uh, was done this time using the stuff from the original release and from the uh, director's edition back in uh, 2000. Uh, and we found a lot, of, a lot of new elements from the ADR tapes, which we didn't have before. 
these were newly discovered, and so all the lines that were recorded for ADR, uh, automatic uh, dialogue replacement, re-recording of the onset uh, dialogue, uh, is brand new and it sounds great and it fits perfectly and it was all directed by Robert Weiss himself at the time so there's a lot of new things that you hear in the soundtrack that was never there before but it sounds amazing and uh, uh, so there so there <laughs> so there thank you now I'm thank you. It's, it's absolutely wonderful um, so the next guy I want to bring up here for you today we're going to go kind of in a little bit of a chronological order. Uh, is a guy who actually worked on the motion picture, and then he went on and did some a few other things in the Star Trek world. A couple. You may you may recognize this man. Um, his name is Rick Sternbach. So, so Rick. Wow. Now, Rick, we're, uh, we're going to have uh, some slides up here for you, um, and you can kind of talk through them as they go. Uh, Okay, now, what I'm going to show you is my experience in the studio uh, situation um, where, you know, when, when I got hired on to Star Trek The Motion Picture, it was by uh, Joe Jennings, who was a terrific production designer. Uh, he actually left uh, shortly after uh, uh, we started work. Uh, he went to work on Shogun. And Harold Michelson came in, and I learned a ton from both men. Uh, learned a ton from Mike Miner, who was uh, the senior illustrator there. I miss, I miss him terribly. Uh, John Cartwright, who was our lead set designer, uh, learned just so much from him. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to run through real quickly some, you know, some of the typical things that that would be done in. Uh, uh, pen and ink and marker and uh, eventually computer uh, up through, you know, what I worked on uh, with uh, Star Trek Voyager. So, okay, happen. Okay, inventing the future. Well, yeah, there's, you know, we're, we're into like the 23rd, 24th centuries. Uh, lots of different uh, things got uh, uh, designed and built. Uh, you know, my sketches would leave my desk and other crafts people would really bring them uh, to life, uh, like the props and the miniatures. Okay, tap. Okay, well, that's, that's a nicely posed picture of me, um, you know, with uh, my design for the uh, uh, Klingon attack cruiser, the Borcha. Um, and I'm pointing at something, I have no idea what. Uh, tap. And this was a rubber gun card. <laughs> okay, this is me on, on uh, the motion picture. Uh, I got to uh, I got to work with uh, Lee Cole and Mike Weiner, um, and uh, I ended up doing maybe a third of the control panels on the Enterprise and uh, some of the other sets. Uh, control panels, signage, okay, airlock this way, transporter this way, uh, and then. Okay, we were doing things in hot press illustration board and rapidograph pen with India ink, and we liked it. <laughs> okay, and a lot of the graphics were turned into high con black and white eggs. We were taken downstairs to uh, the uh, stage effects people who would gel them up with green and blue and red and, and yellow and uh, install them into the control panels. Okay, and light them from behind. And we ended up using this technique uh, initially on Next Gen uh, until we, uh, we were uh, you know, getting into like super high res um, um, uh, uh, printers that could print on backlit uh, film material. So we watched all of this technology develop, happen. Okay, uh, typical, typical black and white uh, controls. These were for the, uh, uh, the travel pod. Okay, and some of you may have heard the story. Uh, I, I, got, I got to work late one morning, and you're talking $1,000 a minute production cost, and the note on my desk said, Mr. Wise wants to see you immediately. So I got down the stage, Mr. Wise, what, you know, I got your note, what can I do for you? 
and he ushers me and Jimmy Dewan and, and Bill Shatner over to the back of the pod. And he said, uh, you designed these control panels, right? I said, yes, yes, sir. Tell Scotty what to do. <laughs> okay, so then, you know, I said, Jimmy, okay, when you first walk in, you know, hit the environmental controls and the lighting controls and the stage electricians will bring the lights up and, uh, you know, then you guys can go up to the forward panel and make the thing fly, right? And Robert Wise thanked me and I went back to my desk and, uh, wow, <laughs> you know, uh, quite, a, uh, quite a thing to, you, you know, to have the director trust me to, to know what it was that we had designed and built. Tap it. Okay, more controls, uh, some of the uh, lighting and environmental controls. Again, black and white art, uh, very specifically to fit um, the uh, control panels and some of the lighting uh, grids that they, they installed next. Okay, uh, you know, quick sketches for things that would be built out of uh, uh, Lucite and Bondo and, and uh, plexiglass and, and aluminum, you know, everything like that. Next. Okay, and eventually control panels, this was Chekhov's, uh, can, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah, okay, check, check off some uh, weapon station. Uh, so we have shield controls and photon torpedoes and uh, uh, phaser controls and a big uh, display. Uh, next. Um, I, you know, I got to do some little sketches when they were, when they were planning out the, uh, uh, the dry dock. Um, most of the miniature work was really not done in our art department. Okay, a lot of these uh, tasks were uh, uh, handled at other facilities. Next. Okay, I did get to do one painting, which took forever. Um, and in Hollywood, no, you can't take forever. You know, it's get this thing out so it can be rebuilt. Uh, but this was before uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Ford aft uh, uh, plasma uh, tunnels were put in. Next. Uh, typical signage, okay, these were done on uh, brushed aluminum and uh, silk screen and photosensitive uh, materials. Uh, and, and you may notice some of these ended up in, what, Strange New Worlds? Some of these graphic elements. So it's like, I had not a clue. <laughs> but, you know, they're borrowing things that, that people have seen before. Next. Uh, Next generation, okay, poor Zorn might have been like tortured by the uh, Farpoint Critter. Um, again, some of these things, you know, we draw them, some get approved, some don't, uh, some get built, some don't. Next. Um, Farpoint Mall, we built the center section. Um, you know, this, the construction people will go over this, budget it, and, uh, you know, some things get knocked out. Next. <coughs> um, hardware, uh, you know, we, uh, we ended up doing uh, lots of concepts for things like the uh, communicator. Um, the upper left, okay, would have been a big clunky thing with lights and sounds. And Gene Roddenberry looked at a bunch of my sketches and said, why not just make it the Starfleet emblem? And I smacked my head, duh, you know, and he was absolutely correct. Next. Um, for a, a, uh, a project that came way after, um, um, you know, I was there at the studio, uh, this could have been like the internal guts of a communicator. All right, and this was fun because I love the tech. Next, uh, the hypo spray. Okay, the, uh, Gene Ryberry wanted everything, you know, uh, smaller, faster, sleeker, easier to use. Uh, this particular hypo that, you know, Beverly Crusher would routinely jab people in the neck with uh, was actually inspired by my, uh, my albuterol inhaler. Okay, and I'm holding this thing in my hand. I had, I had some breathing thing for like a year and a half. And I'm looking, and it's like, okay, it's got the housing, it's got the ampule that could be, you know, uh, stuck back in there. And that's how the hypo was born. <laughs> You know, based on real life. Next. 
the, the tricorder was based on, uh, for me, the HP41C programmable calculator. So, you know, I just loved all this hardware. So I got to, you know, I got to, to uh, uh, design things based on something you could, you know, one thing you could hold in your hand without uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of trouble. Next. Uh, and there's the medical tricorder. This was a CG render. Next. Um, a future tricorder, you know, uh, occasionally we have to uh, update everything. Next. Uh, the pad, the pad was, uh, you know, I think initially uh, suggested by Dorothy Fontana. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, you look, at, you look at handheld displays that are, t you know, in today's science fiction shows, and this thing looks amazingly clunky in comparison. Uh, but this is what we started with, you know, it, we, you know, we had never seen things like this before. And some people say, well, hey, you know, you, 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 your stuff came before the iPhone or the iPod. And you no, know, I mean, for, for us, I think it was more of a convergence. We were heading toward this kind of stuff anyway. And now we have it in our hands, right? Next. Uh, Jordy always wanted something of his own for, uh, you know, for his equipment, so he had his own special pad. Next. Uh, the, everybody had pads, right? Okay. The Klingons had pads, but in this case, you can't mistake this for any other culture because of the, you know, the, the shapes and the colors. All right, so this is very much a Klingon pad. Next. Uh, Romulan pad, and the words on the back say, if found, please return to the Romulan episode. <laughs> Next. Okay, um, uh, weapon design. You know, we went through just piles and piles of drawings, uh, and the producers eventually honed in on something they, they liked. Next. Okay, getting closer to the to the uh, season three, getting away from the dust buster. Uh, they wanted something more angular, and I was more than happy to help. Next. Okay, uh, early production unit. I, I, I liked this particular version, and uh, there were other mods that were made by uh, our prop makers in later seasons. Next. Uh, the Type 4 compression phaser rifle. I love this. Um, and, uh, you know, seeing Janeway running down the hallway with this thing ready to, you know, blast a, a, an alien virus, you know, was, was fun. Next. <laughs> Uh, everybody had, you know, everybody had weapons. Uh, Ferengi styling came into this one, next. Um, the Kazon had this, this crazy clunky thing with pipes on it, next. Uh, oh, I love the Cardassian. This, you know, I, I was inspired by a trilobite. So, uh, you know, we, we get our inspirations from everywhere. Right, guys? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, to, you know, a, a, a hardware, Starfleet hardware, and, you know, whatever the script called for, uh, yeah, we whipped some sketches together and, you know, uh, some, some, again, some of the other uh, uh, craft people would, would turn these into reality. Next. Uh, a, you know, a medical widget, uh, again, you know, whatever the script called for, whatever the prop, uh, uh, Property uh, uh, managers, you know, needed for a scene. Next, uh, okay, an Iconian widget, uh, which was you know found in an alien location. Uh, we have no idea what it was supposed to do, but you know, funny thing, it had uh, it had writing on it that said like K and Yuri and Dirty Pair. Uh -huh. and <laughs> next. Um, Okay, an alien leg brace. Okay, uh, most of the alien stuff that I did, you know, had lots of plating and painted copper. So, <laughs> next. Um, you know, uh, lots of lots of alien widgets. Okay, uh, these would not look typically like Starfleet. So, uh, you know, uh, lots of curves, uh, lots of funny uh, venting and. Uh, Little, little, just you know, button things. Next. Uh, oh well, 
<laughs> uh, Dr. Stubbs still a probe, uh, and, and this, uh, you know, uh, Nammo from the Dirty Pair was also the inspiration for the Exocom. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, blame, blame me, next. Uh, and now, CG, we got into CG so we could do, uh, you know, early concepts of things like be inside of a, a warpness cell and show to the producers within, you know, uh, uh, a few minutes, next. Okay, uh, ships, all right, runabout. Uh, we went through a number of iterations of the runabout. Uh, Jim Martin over in the DS9 art department helped out with some amazing uh, uh, surface detailing, so we incorporated that. Next. Uh, and black and white sketch, add some marker to it, and you know, we got something to show the producers. Next. Um, a little different, you know, uh, Rick Berman wanted the nacelles to be seen, okay, they were a signature piece of hardware, next. And, and we finally, you know, we finally put it all together with uh, some of Jim Martin's uh, uh, exterior detailing and, uh, um, you know, we already, now the thing, so, sometimes, they will have the sets built before we get to design the miniatures. All right, so a lot of things like windows, uh, the locations and the scaling sort of have to match what goes into the model. Uh, so the cockpit, the runabout cockpit was already a reality when this thing was built. Thanks. Uh, and later on, you know, we have like a chase between two runabouts, and you wanted to differentiate between the two of them, so they had me put, a, you know, a sensor pod up on top of one. Next. Okay, Voyager, you know, again, starting with sketches and, and just evolving things. Next. Uh, and, you know, more versions, more sketching, more, more shapes. Uh, I thought this was a perfectly valid version, uh, Jerry Taylor, who I would do anything for, I, you know, she, she was terrific. Uh, she pulled me aside and said, can, can you make it a little curvier, kind of like a Lexus? And I said, Jerry, for you, anything. Okay, next. Uh, and this was another view of, of the prototype, um, which, uh, um, you know, we built in Bondo and foam core and uh, he's now available as a little die-cast model, next. And there was the, there was the, uh, the phone core model. And you know, the producers like to walk around physical things. We love to make models of the sets so the directors can plan things out. Um, and this allowed the producers to walk around and, and you know, look at things, next. Okay, and there was a CG render of the prototype. Next. Uh, another CG render. Next. And the final, okay, with the, with the, curvy, the curvy bits. Um, and a little bit, you know, of a connection to the curviness of the Enterprise D, the Galaxy class. Um, next. Okay, and there's a, a beauty shot uh, that uh, Gary Hustle uh, took of the miniature. This particular image involved at least six passes uh, with different lighting systems turned on. Okay, there's, uh, you know, there was a, uh, uh, a backlit pass, there was a pass for the Sard collectors, there was a pass for the Warthney cells, uh, a pass for the, uh, um, the main deflector dish, and uh, Gary, we also missed terribly, uh, he was a master of putting these images together. And you know, I'm gonna stop right there. So uh, close the lid and uh, I think we're, uh, we're good. Thank you. That's just like a small amount of what you've done. What? That's like a small amount of what you've done. I was there for 15 years. 15 years. Yeah, I was Right. And John, how long have you been there? <laughs> All right, our, uh, our next guy we're going to bring up is, uh, as going in chronological order after uh, Rick and Miller's picture, is a guy uh, you may not recognize in his current getup. 
Um, it's Mr. Kirk Thatcher. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you need Cheetos to make my beard look orange, but it didn't. It as as I yeah, well, uh, I grew up loving Star Trek, the original series, and the animated series, and, um, oh boy, there's, it's a long way how I got there, but the short version is I worked at Island for a couple of years on a, a Jedi and, and Poltergeist and I worked actually on Star Trek 2 and 3 on 2 and, and each, each movie I had more and more to do. On 2 I just helped make the um, set of worms and the big gear that Chekhov had. Uh, just mainly molding, casting, painting, very, very kind of basic creature stuff. And then on, on uh, 3 I was on set and I, I helped build the uh, Klingon dog, which I was told is not weak. We called it Fifi. Uh, but I told it to be retcon to do a Tharg or some, some you know, lizard dog name. And uh, I helped build it and finish it, and I puppeteered it, so part of my job was sitting beneath Christopher Lloyd's butt in that chair with my, a little hole cut the side of the chair with my right arm out, just kind of you know, animating the dog, uh, just keeping him alive. And then the other job was, uh, I don't know if they have those pictures, I, I think somebody said they had them, but uh, was doing the uh, worms. Uh, this is all Trek 4. Okay, well, that's fine. So I'll just go briefly. Uh, I did the worm that crushes crushes that's come out of Spock's coffin. So I was on set for a couple of weeks, but I didn't really interact with Leonard except uh, when he was talking about you know, how to move the dog or something. So Star Trek 4 happened because I had left ILM, went back to UCLA to study computer graphics because I thought, well, these are going to take over this business. And uh, I was in the UCLA animation department, and they got a call from Leonard Nimoy's office, who was starting on Star Trek IV, and he wanted an assistant who knew the filmmaking process, but particularly special effects, and I would literally left an island a year earlier. So I went and interviewed, we, we hit it off just personally, but I was kind of like joke, genetically engineered for that job. I, I had worked at island for two and a half, three years, I knew everybody there, I'd worked on Star Trek II and III, and so I got the job and uh, started as just basically, it was amazing, I was 23, I didn't think, I wouldn't hire a 23 year old to do what Leonard let me do. Um, he, and when he, when he sat down, he said, look, I want, I want to focus on the heart of the movie, which is, it's interesting what you're saying about uh, him hating the first motion picture. Because we talked about the Star Trek movies, he said, I didn't hate it, and he said, I did too, because it was not about the characters. He said, I want this one to be about their relationships and the characters, and I don't want a big bad, and so that's what the script was. You know, the big bad is humanity's ignorance. Um, but he said, I want to focus on the heart of this, which is the, the story and the characters. So I want you to kind of keep me abreast of all the technical stuff that you know, I either don't know about, because I don't want to learn about models and miniatures and matte paintings, um, and also the uh, technical stuff of um, the aesthetic things. If I, you know, I, uh, one of the things we talked a lot about in interviews, I've done production design, I've done some rock videos with David Fincher, and so I showed him my tape of production design stuff I've done. I've done an alien thing, and just some very basic like hotel room kind of sets. And, and so he said, you know, I want you to come back to me and tell me what's going on with the sets and all that, but I don't want to go to every meeting. I really want to focus on the script and the story. So I had this, uh, a great amount of, I said it was like, you know, I have the king's stamp. So I'd go to these meetings, in fact, the name for the band in Star Trek for Edge of Etiquette was the nickname Ralph Winter gave me because I was 23 and probably too stupid to know I shouldn't say these things in meetings. And he said, you, you just, you're always walking the edge of etiquette. Because um, I would just, I don't know, be sassy like I am. Uh, but I had a great experience. So we started on the project and I, I had a little Mac 512 computer and I remember when they were Nick Myers was doing the second, the middle of the movie, all the stuff in the present day, or 1985, 1986, Earth, and uh, Harv Bennett was focusing on everything in uh, the 23rd century. So one of the scenes was the uh, punk on the bus, and I went to Leonard. I'd been in a band uh, in high school, and I had short orange hair. I didn't have a full mohawk because it's a lot of work. But I said, "Hey, I I want to play this part," and he said, huh, "Let me let me think about it." So. He gave me a week, and I, I drifted the letter when I do his thing. Ah, let me think about it. Um, he uh, said, let me think about it. I said, I'm not going to bother him. So a week later, we would have, at the end of every day, he had a big gin and tonic, Bombay Sapphire gin and tonic. And uh, we'd just relax and talk about the day and what's happening tomorrow. So we had our little meeting. It was like a Tuesday. So about a week later, and I was leaving, and he said, ah, uh, one more thing. He was like, yeah. I said, you, you can do it. And I was like, oh, you're not going to regret this. So I 
went and got, I knew the gal who dyed my hair orange and, and gave me sort of punky hair and I went to her and we dyed my hair orange and I got all the gear, the jacket was mine, the, all the, the only thing they provided me with was the boombox and my shoes. <laughs> and uh, so I, I got to do this bit and uh, there I am uh, 35 years later and uh, the, a new version of the song which basically says, I still hate you. Uh, and then the, the first lyrics are, 35 years later and nothing much has changed. Um, and that all came about because uh, Terry Madalas, who became the showrunner in the second season of Picard, he uh, sent me a, uh, oh, and it was directed by Leah Thompson, who's a friend, and, and now we text each other all the time. It's funny, we've been, I've known her since Howard the Duck, but uh, she's delightful. And she's the one who let me, the script originally just said, uh, you know, she asked her to turn it down, he kind of looks at her, and then he, he goes, you know, just turns it off. And she, the last tape, she said, well, you know, don't be afraid to say anything. Well, it's funny, because the original punk uh, role was basically a featured extra, because there was no dialogue. And they said, don't say anything, or suddenly we have to make you an actor. But because I did the song, they had to get me into SAG. So this time, Lee was like, okay, well, just react like you think you would, and say what you think you would say. You don't have to be silent, just kind of cower. So that's how the uh, apologies and all that came back, or came up. Um, and it was great, it was so much fun. Uh, the, the cast and crew were really sweet. There's a great picture of me with uh, Jerry and, um, I forgot the other guy, that was name, but I'd have to see him with him. Just had a great time. It was a, really only about three hours out of my life, but uh, it was a lot of fun. And it's, uh, the, the fans, it's really funny. I was, Darren, I was telling Darren about this, the, the fans have kind of, it's become this, big point of contention, does that mean that, because I guess technically if, if I was the same character, then, then it couldn't happen because uh, Spock and Kirk wouldn't have come back and so how would I remember it? And so uh, others have, I just retconning because fans love it so much, which is why it's such a great series. They're like, oh no, it's a multi-universe. It's a multi-universe because he's also in Spider-Man. <laughs> so I am, I am now officially a multi-universe nexus. And the universes revolve around me, and I exist in all different times. Uh, so, but it's fun. The other thing is, I would say 85 to 90 percent of the fans are like, "Oh, great fan service," and that small percentage is like, "Ew, yuck, fan service." Uh, but it was great and super fun, and most I would say 90 percent of the reaction has been really positive, and it was a blast. And I don't know. You guys can ask me questions about any of that stuff later. I don't want to take up time from the rest of the panel, but thank you. All right. Thank you. Great job. It was a wonderful surprise. I don't know how people like you can keep that stuff secret. Oh, this is amazing. That was hard last year because all of you guys and like, what'd you do, huh? Did you uh, a monthly movie? Why do you have short hair? It was hot. All right. Well, uh, this next guy, you probably don't know anything about him. Uh, he's never been to the show before. Let's give a warm, wonderful first time uh, applause for Mr. John Eves. Good day. It was wonderful to be with old friends again and back to the show. And uh, been, you know, been a long time since we've been here. And it's it's kind of funny that we all are here because we love Star Trek. You're all here because we love Star Trek. And everyone is here has a wonderful, unique story. Is this my close up? Of, of how we got here, and we've all worked together throughout before. Either we know it or we don't, we find out later, uh, especially now with the pandemic and stuff. But it's great to get to be here, and what's really fun is, is Bill Krause next to me here. Um, he's like a fan, he's like a, super, a super fan that takes his fandom into reality with his beautiful Starship model work. And we always pitch people from Wonderfest to the show, and it never goes anywhere. But what happened on this show, Picard, is our showrunner knew, knew his work. He was a fan of him. So we brought him up when we needed models for the show. He goes, I love Bill Cross. And so it was fabulous that somebody from the kind of our, our world of being a fan before we actually got to be a part of the show. <laughs> this was fantastic that he got to share his talents and be on the, on the crew with us. So this was his first Star Trek experience for, for reality. But like I said, we're all we're all here because we're fans and we luckily got into shows one way or another. And with the Star Trek designing work, what's fun about it is Star Trek goes backwards and forwards on itself. And so after Nemesis, we spent 20 years going backwards and with Picard, we got to go forwards again. And But we still have the same challenges, like we'll retrofit 
favorite shifts for the older shows, and now we're futurizing shifts that we do from the uh, next generation era. And one of the ones that we always thought would be kind of fun to do is the Stargazer. And so what we have here is, is kind of how the story of the Stargazer came to be. And um, the first season, we had Todd Chernowski, our production designer, and he moved on to some Amblin shows and Star Wars. He's on both that and all the other shows now. And so we brought in a new guy named Dave Blass as our production designer. He is also a Trek fan. So our project was to come up with a new version of the Stargazer. So as you're going here, it's the sketch process. So we do all kinds of crazy, outrageous things. We show them to the producers and the showrunners. They go, yes, no, hate it, love it. But we just keep going. We find something that, that in the art part that we kind of feel follows the tradition, yet reaches over into the next generation era. And so we did have a whole series of different ideas and concepts and sketches of how this ship is going to come together, uh, yet make it recognizable, yet still have a future look to it where it's in the timeline where it belongs. And so we go through, we get a sketch that we like, we take it to this stage here, which is a little bit more grayscale. We pitch that a little bit, see what they like. So we're basically, all this is for feedback. This was kind of the one they were starting to, to gravitate towards. And we had this interesting thing where we're going to have a through the front of the saucer shuttle bay that kind of disappeared. But we hit a, a, a one point where we had to fly through shuttle bay. What's it going to look like? Is it going to be tapered? Is the saucer going to be round? So all these sketches experiment with these different looks and ideas. And this was kind of going for a while here. They were liking this idea. Um, uh, as far as the art department goes, we were thinking, let's, let's keep going with the concept. So we did a couple of new lines here to see what top and side views look. We're kind of happy with that, so we start moving on in some other directions. Um, there's kind of a, a little bit more cleaner view of that top view, and it just didn't look right. It didn't look stargazer enough. Uh, so we uh, did a color version just to make sure, a little black and white, a little bit more color on it. And the next side here is another view of that same idea. I just put this together so you might have some close-ups. <laughs> Too many of the same thing. But anyways, here's a little blue scale just to test the grays on it. And we'll move into the next one here. This sketch we kind of liked a lot and started to develop a little bit further. So, okay, this kind of has a good feeling to it. And as you see in the back, it has a central knob like the original Stargazer where there's a, kind of a, a T-frame in there and the mesa branch off above and below the saucer on it. And we're going right along those lines. We're liking it, getting into it. And uh, one of the showrunners and the producers looked at it and they go, you know, every time we look out the observation lounge window, we're going to have an optical. Let's put a big giant structure of the ship back there so you don't have to have an optical every time. And it really kind of messed with the aesthetic of what the Stargazer was. So the whole point from there on was to try to make this structure to keep the Stargazer look intact. And in the meantime, we're doing nacelles, we're doing all this stuff to kind of come up with different things. We have graphic guys needing things, so there you can kind of see where that, that big center sweep is going to start changing here any second. And uh, so in the meantime, we're doing bridge details, we do the exterior, do a couple different variations on that. They wanted the, uh, the ever-popular JJ front window screen. Uh, then we start doing uh, roughs for the interior so the dead designers could go. So kind of my job is just to do these rough concepts that just get the ideas going, and from there goes the CG department, set decorator, set designer. So everything is a gigantic collaboration that we all get together and have a part in. And the COVID issue has caused issues because we don't work together anymore, so we don't really see what each other's doing to tie things together. Uh, if you're lucky, you get assigned with somebody, like with this, you know, I was hooked up with Doug Drexler, and so I'm doing the sketches and he's doing the CG models, and as you see the progression, once they start liking stuff, we'll do plans to see how they lay out the crude and the rough, but they're enough to kind of tell the story on. And this is the room, the view out that rear window, what the earlier Stargazer was going to look like. That's the hoop that they had us add at the end to fill in that gap. And it, like I was saying, it caused a very big architectural challenge to make that work. But uh, through time and finessing and stuff and, and having Doug's input and model work, um, it, it came together. So you kind of see how it goes together, how the bridge, how the, how the, the bearings work, how the base cells work. Um, but what to do with that that piece right there in the center was the big issue. Is it going to be applied to shuttle bay? Is it going to be an arboretum? What's it going to be? So we experimented with all of these different different ideas of what would be in that, that particular area. 
and we wanted to decide to make that the engineering section. So uh, um, as far as the design goes, that's where the, uh, the work I see where the lake cells were, where the, uh, the condos, all of the uh, internal design work goes in that central section. Then we have nacelle design. Then, for some reason, since discovery, nacelles are the hardest thing to get approved. We'll draw anywhere from 50 to 100 of them. And uh, we did, this is the new version looking out that rear window. And it has kind of a Robert McCall inspired stained glass to kind of help with the hide the optical that would go behind that window. Here's where Doug Drexler comes in, starts his crude model on the bottom. And moving on to the next is a little bit cleaner. And from there, we start going back and forth. And uh, I'll take his model and do Photoshop work on top, and he'll go back and he'll change things. So it's really fun to work with him. And from there, when the model's finished, I get uh, his finished model, and then I do these paint overs on the top of it. So we'll figure out what the paint's going to look like, how the lighting works. And at one point, we're trying to do a little bit futuristic hull lighting. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool if the uh, registry number was internally lit, so it's its own light source. And it went for a long time, uh, but in the end, they decided to go back to the traditional spotlight uh, illumination of the NC numbers and the, uh, the names of the ship. But this is Doug's model with, with the photo painters on top of it. And so it was really, in the end, we were like really, really happy with how it turned out. Um, uh, from there, it goes to visual effects, and they kind of take it and they tweak it the way they need to. And it's a whole different world when it goes to the effects. And uh, this is an interesting, if you all know, we, well, that was the Stargate part. But if you know a gentleman named uh, Justin the Blues Man, he was a big, big guy that came to the, the Wonderfest forever. He passed away not too long ago, but um, he loved cargo ships. And I came across this task where I had to do a cargo ship. And I thought it would be cool to make a logo in honor of, of Justin. So on the bottom right there is a, a quick copy of it. And the next frame, there it is. So that's Justin the Blues Man. Right, so logo. So uh, he loves Star Trek and in a way we got to, got to sneak him in. So uh, it, I, I couldn't think of any other better way to make him be a part of it than, than that. So and I don't know where that could appear in the series if at all, but it, as far as art forms go, it, it got his uh, approval on his logo. So, but that's kind of how the concept stuff works. And that's kind of my end of the presentation on it. So uh, I hope you, it was fast and I hope you enjoyed getting to see that whole kind of sketch to final Ship process. So next, I'll hand it over to. What? Hey, thanks, man. Wow. I love that. Not just for coming on the screen. Uh, I think everybody's jaw just kind of went a little bit that were in the ships that saw that stargazer. It was just gorgeous. You know, I really like the two impulse crystals thing there. That was really awesome. So our our, uh, our last guy here today is one of our own, and his name is Bill Krauss, and. Uh, he is now permanently in shrine in Star Trek lore, right? Yeah. That's right. So here he is. He's Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me? I, as Brian was saying, I'm a longtime Winterfest uh, contestant. And uh, then one day last year, about this time last year, I was asked uh, to contribute to Star Trek officially. Uh, you know, thanks to John Easter for putting my foot in the door. But it was really through Instagram and Terry Metallus who, uh, who asked me initially to uh, build the Red Room models of the Stargazers for Seasons with Picard. And uh, along the way, say, well, can you also design a TOS version of the Stargazer I've never seen before? And I said, sure. That's kind of my thing. So I was honored to be able to do that. So um, one weekend I had to uh, present some ideas and concepts about this TOS. Stargazer might look like. And they, they didn't all have to be four engine ships. I gave them six concepts, and I think this one here is the one they picked, which was the first one, uh, which I then refined further. But yeah, these are the six different ships that we originally gave them. And uh, I just kind of gave them a bunch of everything that I had in my built cross library of Star Trek parts different engines, different hulls, and just a combination of things to uh, get an idea of what they wanted to do. And uh, they just picked the first concept, which I hadn't seen the, the new Star Trek yet. It actually looked a lot like that, so you know, they wanted to pick another traditional forge and uh, design. And uh, it's a little concept A. It's a great. Um, it was like Monday, the following weekend, I'd be presenting these six different concepts. And uh, I, on my own, went ahead and refined it further 
And uh, I didn't think they even cared if I did anything more to it. So there's no back and forth. It was just like, we'll take A, make this. So, um, this construction of the, uh, the original Stargazer uh, the constellation for the class that uh, uh, Lauren Oliver and I uh, recreated based on uh, Rick's original radio room model. We actually used a lot of the, uh, the same parts that he had uh, acquired in the role of vintage anime uh, repo parts and uh, a couple of uh, uh, original, well, at this time with, with the, uh, the Aztec 537 scale uh, Enterprise hull and the cells beside that, and uh, followed uh, his plan and, and built the uh, Stargate model pretty much the way it was done originally on the TNG show. Uh, we scratched both the styrene and everything, and uh, it took us about 10 days. We had, they given us about two months to build all three of these models, and uh, we had the 3D model of the, the new Stargate from Doug Ressler, which had to go through the whole process of being hollowed out and being be made printable. And then my version of the Star Wars, which was also printed, that was all being done at the same time we were working on the, uh, the middle one of the constellation. And this was, these were all, at the time we were building these, they were, they had told us that these would be all painted. So we were not designing this for plating, which is what we typically do, what John's typically done on the show. So they were not quite optimized for, for, for plating, they were all still hollow. And we realized after the fact that they, uh, they need to be solid, so they had to drill holes in all of these models uh, to make them so they would sink to the bottom of the, the, the plating tank, which left them marred with uh, a lot of holes and leaking stuff coming out of it while it was sitting on set. Um, here it is in primer. You can kind of slip through a bunch of these. But all these models for the Stargate, including ours as a group, um, are seen in a little niche on the, the lounge of the new Stargazer. And they're only seen in one episode, in one shot, for one second, from about 100 feet away, behind Jerry Land's head. So if you saw any of these at all, thank you for watching the show. But uh, it's, a, it's a great thrill and honor to be a part of this. And I thank John and everyone for inviting me to be a part of Star Trek. And uh, there's more to see in, in season three. And I've done those uh, radio models as well. And I think from what I hear, they're on screen much more than the music here. So looking forward to that. So this is the, uh, the saving class. Start the user that's been on. They were sent in, in pieces. I think that one was sent in pieces. It was just so fragile to send it one piece, but it was plated in several, several pieces that were glued together. And each had a, a, two mounting points. They weren't quite sure if you were going to mount them um, uh, from the side or from the bottom. So there's like a, a T-shaped um, uh, joint in the center of the t shirt so they could slide them however they wanted on the wall. I believe both the, uh, the TOS and the uh, TNG Stargazer are kind of mounted sideways. Whereas the new one is not from his belly in the center of the niche. I think once we get to the plated shots, we'll see them as they appear on the set. I think that did change several times. Um, this is the uh, these are the dedication points that I designed that don't appear on the show, but I made them for John and I just for our own display models. We, I made duplicates of these for um, both Dave Blast, who wanted his wanted to keep the, uh, the screen new Stargazer model. John and I made duplicates of our own for just ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I have the golden with me at the show, it's in my room, but if you see it around, I put a little on, on the cart. Here they are on the show, in the lounge. And it's probably the best view you'll ever see of it, is this behind the scenes shot that they, that they took of it. I believe that's it. some interesting questions for you guys, but I'm sure that the audience probably has some as well. Um, you want to, yeah, why don't I take a walk around and if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll get to you, okay? Does that sound good? Hey, you Kirk? You got questions? Well, I have questions. 
Hey, man. What's your name? Hi, I'm Nayar. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. And I was just wondering, this is going to Bill and John, when the Stargazer came to the fore in the Picard series, we were expecting a letter to go after that, just like we've seen on the Enterprise. Was there talk of putting a letter behind it? Or if so, if not, what's the story behind it? Yeah, uh, yes there was. We had thought about doing Stargazer, B, C, L, all that kind of thing. It just didn't sound right. So through Terry McAllis and Dave Blass and a lot of the folks in the art crowd, we decided that the, the uh, addition of the alphabetical order would be reserved for starships and not anything outside of that. So we were kind of create these rules as we go along. And we thought that'd be kind of cool just to reserve that more for the flagships and the starships. And so that's why we went with a different number. Uh, um, I, was it Dave Blass? I think it was Dave Blass that figured out that NC C, C number. A lot of those kind of correlated with what Terry McAllis had. And so there was significance behind a lot of these dates. Um, not sure what the meaning is. Like I said, we don't work in the office. We're all working from home. So we miss out on all these fun discussions. We just get the, the answers at the end, but not the, how the, they came together. But that's how that worked. Hi, anybody else have a question? Here we go. Hey, what's your name? Hi, I'm my name is Jose Vegas. I'm from Sacramento, California. And uh, the Stargazer is absolutely my favorite, one of my favorite Star Trek ships of all time. So the question, for Rick and, and for John and, and Bill to, to kind of, if, if they wanted to add to it. When you, when you came up with the, with the Stargazer, you're, what was the, what kind of direction were you given in, in terms of coming up with the ship for Picard that he commanded way back when? Well, you know, okay, the, uh, the, the word came down that uh, the, the said decorator you know, they, they wanted a, a model to go into Picard's ready room, okay? Um, and uh, and Andy Probert and I, you know, we drew up a few sketches. Um, uh, Andy then got, got uh, uh, you know, real busy with the, the Enterprise and, uh, you know, some of the other episodic stuff. Um, and I was, you know, I was looking around for uh, Starship model parts to uh, use as, as a uh, you know a foundation for the Star Days. Okay, uh, we looked at the TOS Enterprise, which was deemed a little too old. Okay, what was the only other kit out there? The refit. Okay, there was no Excelsior kit out there. There was no Ambassador kit. Um, so I you know I bought a couple of refit kits. Uh, and, you know, uh, went crazy buying a bunch of uh, anime kits for parts, and um, uh, I, I essentially built the thing, all right, and painted it yellow, mainly because it harmonized with the rest of the room, okay, and then later retconned that to be, well, it's a work stress field coating. Okay, so if you run the ship with the yellow coating, you can see where, you know, the field stress lines are, you know, wrecking the surface. <laughs> okay, so that, that was my explanation later, okay. Um, but the, uh, you know, the producers, you know, they liked uh, the fact that it was an older looking ship. Uh, I, I, I thickened up the hull uh, so that it looked like it might have uh, carried a lot of cargo, maybe a lot of shuttles. Uh, I also added little really bits to it uh, that I think were part of a, uh, you know, a, 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 a stealth mission package um, where they could uh, monitor things on the Robin and Neutral Zone. Okay, and that, that, that was just me, okay? Um, but the ship looked, you know, it, it looked, you know, just, a, you know, older and clunky enough um, to be, you, you know, an earlier uh, ship that the car could command. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, where that, that's where that started. There you go. 
All right, anybody ask a question? You got another question. Well, I got tons you, of questions. You don't have to tell your name again. You just ask a question. Can I make up a different name this time? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, this question is for Darren. I just want to say your work on the new director's 4K edition is absolutely incredible. If anybody hasn't seen it, if they think it's just a repackaging of the previous director's edition, they they need to watch it. Uh, you you've I, we watched it with a group of friends, and one guy in the middle of the movie said, "You know what? This actually is starting to make sense now. This re-edit." <laughs> What would you say is the moment that you contributed that you'd say it's you're most proud of? Oh my goodness. Uh, hmm. I really like the main titles. Yeah. I really like the new main titles because I, I, I came up with the configuration of the Star Trek the motion picture with the motion picture set in to Star Trek to make it a little more cohesive because when we were working in 2000, uh, we wanted a way to sort of rebrand it so that it wouldn't be confused with the theatrical edition or the special laundry edition. And so that was the thinking, at least, back then. And uh, I, I, I rendered that, uh, you know, gold, uh, shiny, wonderful 1970s uh, uh, bit. And um, when it came around time to sort of uh, futurize it for uh, 2022, um, I was able to just sort of goose it a little bit and make the colors a little more saturated and I put in a little outline on all the credits and and fitted in a, a, a background uh, disturbance pattern that is very subtle but if you look at it you will notice that it is the moray lines from the V'ger uh, transformation that had been colored gold and put behind the outline of the credits. And uh, it's it's a little, you know, subtle bookending thing to sort of, uh, you know, trick your subconscious into, oh, well maybe that, that does work there. But uh, that, that's my favorite sort of bit of creative uh, uh, contributing to it. And of course, the, the little shot of the Enterprise spiraling back on the yeah. That's always a fun one. And uh, Mojo, our, our CG supervisor and I figured that one out and uh, cleaned up the shot and, and there it is. And I, I, I like that moment too. So that's the answer. All right, I get some of them back. Right, that's good. And back here, that crazy chair. Mm -hmm. Oops, excuse me. Hey, what's your name? I'm Guy Named Guy. I have a question for Kurt, actually. You said that, that uh, you want to send you in at, for all the new show. Uh, was there ever a decision that you made for him or something that you thought later on you were like, wow, that was a really hairy decision probably shouldn't have made without asking him first? Well, I I always ran everything by him. So, like, I had a, a lot of input on the aliens and the, the um, Federation Council, I guess, because I was kind of tired. I said, Star Trek, I mean, uh, Star Wars has great aliens, and Star Trek has, you know, a guy with a shaved head and, Blue horns on it or something. So I said, let's do some uh, really interesting aliens. So uh, Thomas Blackshear is an amazing illustrator. Most people know him. He's done stamps and things, but he's an incredible creature designer. He wanted to work at ILM. Amazing illustrator. So I said, hey, would you do a, a page of alien designs? He's like, sure. And I think he gave him 500 bucks. And uh, it's literally like an 11 by 17 with like 20 different alien designs, and they're all amazing. I have it somewhere. I should probably throw that up on the web. It's just an interesting thing. We can see about, we used about seven or eight of those uh, as designs. Everything else, I, again, I would even run that by Leonard, and he'd say, you know, is there anything you like or don't like? And, and I like, you know, that's why those seven or eight were chosen, if you like them. So I never made ultimate decisions, but I would kind of winnow out stuff. Um, God, it's been so long. Uh, I remember the big thing I hated were the Klingons from the movie, from the motion picture. I said their spines running down to their foreheads, and then, uh, so I said, maybe we can tie, like, loosen that up a little bit, and not have it look like a spinal column on their forehead. So I had some input in that, and he's like, yeah, fine. I mean, it was interesting. He, everything else was, geez, I think the art department kind of took care of things. I would just go to meetings to, a lot of the times it was just to, Basically, take an hour and a half meeting and give it to him in three minutes because he didn't move. Really Wasn't there that one time that you said, Hey, Leonard, what about making them whales? 
That's true. <laughs> I did, okay, some things that people don't know that I did have him put in, uh, all the questions that Spock has asked at the beginning, he said, logic is not ever so That was my voice, and I wrote all those questions. I also did the gag with uh, Scotty on the computer. I had a new Mac, it was a 512, so it was the second version of a Macintosh. And so when they, first they said, well, he's gotta go to the computer, so make it a Macintosh, because they're graphic game. So he sits down and I said, well, he would talk to the computer. So this was my, as a Star Trek fan, I said he wouldn't type, he would talk to it, because he doesn't know where he is in time. So he did that, and I said, oh, and then when he says, use the mouse, he said, you should use it like a microphone. So those, <laughs> those were kind of input I had, little gags that I got to do, um, which uh, I love that, A, they let me do it. Because um, Leonard, again, he wanted to be a fun movie, not, you know, someone said, uh, Star Trek, Wrath of Khan is a great Star Trek movie, and uh, Voyage Home is a great movie. You don't have to be a Star Trek fan to, to love it. So I think a lot of that was just him enjoying the characters and the humor between them, and just humor in general, you know, the fish out of water games. Um, but yeah, I think there was something else I did. But th th those were the things that most people don't know. Oh, I, I put a Star Wars Easter egg in there. Uh, T. Plana Hoff is Planet Hoff with just the T slid around. <laughs> So that was my little like definitely get Star Wars into Star Trek. So yeah, but he was amazing boss and really like great to work with, not for we felt like working on. Thank you. Alright. Uh these guys someone else up your hand up. Uh up front here. You did? Kirk kind of alluded to this first. Uh, I'm Dan from Denver. Um Kind of, kind of alluded to this just a few minutes ago. Uh, every every artist and every designer has stuff they enjoy. You know, great, great anime. You're you know all over the place. Well, when, when you're designing something, do you you try you try to slip some of those influences in as a signature move? You know, I, I uh, as an example, I I talked to John uh, uh, Goodman, the, the uh, makeup artist, uh, a number of years ago. And he mentioned that he likes to put a fly somewhere on every dead body. That's how you can tell that it was him. What kind of stuff do you guys try to start out with and, and as, as go to with a, as, a, as a sign that that was your baby? Each of you. Start with you guys. Oh. Uh, I don't know, that's kind of interesting. I, got, I always put my, uh, my wife and kids' initials in everything somewhere. So. Sometimes the ships are shaped like their letters, or uh, there's detailed panels that have their, their, their initials are everywhere. So, they're always there. Uh, I, I, I don't think I had... Oh, uh, go, 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 go. No, go for it. Conical Bessards. <laughs> and it's like the best pickup line I've ever heard. <laughs> hey. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't think I was able to, to, you know, sneak in a lot of, of stuff because, you know, the production time was like, you know, hey, where are the sketches, you know, we need them now. Well, I don't mean on just Star Trek, I mean anything. Or oh, anything? Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of start out, in, in any of the concept stuff that I've done, I start out thinking, well, what would Ron Cobb have done? And I fall way short, but at least I start from a, a, a good spot to be inspired by. It. I think I, when I was on the pilot of Voyager uh, with Rick, I did a, a bunch of concepts for uh, alien ships and things like that. And one of them was sort of a combination of uh, the uh, Nostromo front with like a, a sloped uh, uh, cabin that came down, and and behind it was a space 1999 uh, Eagle space frame, yeah. um, and you know so I, I try to go from stuff that I love and try to sneak it in whenever I can, and of course you know all this stuff that comes back is eh we don't really you know we don't really respond to this so you know that's among the five or six different things that uh, you put in and. You just try to get inspiration from everywhere, really. I mean, you know, looking at the, the at the chandelier, you know, that looks like a, the front of a uh, bizarre collector. Um, and, you know, you just you sort of have to get inspiration from anywhere you can because 
it happens so fast that you gotta you gotta pick ideas out of thin air sometimes. So that's that's the main challenge of the thing because if you could just sit and do your own thing and have it approved immediately, then everyone could do it. I, actually, one one thing that that collectively we did on Next Generation was the uh, the engineering cutaway of the ship. Yeah, you know, you, there's there's a mouse, there's a uh, there's a Porsche, there's a, you know, you know, we just we just threw a bunch of stuff in there. Now, at the time, very tiny, um, you know, TV res at, 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 in the day was uh, was not that great. Um, no thought of HD presentation at all. Oh <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> You know, but uh, some of these little, some of these little, little, little uh, surprises, uh, you know, uh, eventually, you know, popped out. And uh, but it was fine at the time because we weren't stepping on the drama. You know, they were just little things that that, that flash by. I, I think like Easter eggs, I guess they call it now, where you put in things like that, or you know, putting in Planet Hoth and, and just dialogue. For me, if there's two reasons. There's one I, stuff I love that I want to see, and it's influenced by you know amazing artists like these guys and, and all the guys who work in Star Wars. Also, there's things that I don't want to see. Like I'm really angry that we always see. You know, for me, Klingons look like waffles are stapled to their heads. Like, well, that makes no sense. So I wanted to, you know. So sometimes it's a reaction. It's like, or I'm really tired of this being done that way. And I, I noticed that with directors I work with too. They want to do a scene in a different way. So it, some of it's reactive, and some of it's just out of a passion for something, a uh, color scheme or whatever, you know, or something I've always wanted to see and never got to see. But, I mean, I remember on Star Wars, Joe Johnston designed the uh, Slave One. It was based on a, it's like an iron or a hair dryer or something. It's a light, a light fixture. A light fixture, yeah. So, you know, you just look at things and when you're a designer, when you're a creative, you know, visually creative person, you can kind of see that weird shape. I remember guys were making, uh, Bill George would probably have the stories to talk about this, but the, the big fleet that shows up at the end of uh, Jedi to you know, defeat the, uh, the Empire, there was like laundry bottles with gurneys on it, because we had to, I forgot, there was like 250 ships or something. So they were just making stuff up, and it was, and it was fun. I mean, a lot of it is what makes you laugh, like what's fun. So, kind of Thanks. Let's try to tag in on that, because what, what Darren was saying, um, all of us grew up with, Two artists, Sid Gaden and Brian Cobb. And with Darren, he had good work with Brian Cobb, but you know, we all kind of gravitate to that. And you're right, because we all start with the, our, our heroes, Joe Jobs and Brian Cobb, Ron Capone and stuff. And, and uh, he's right. You know, that all comes through, and you do think, like, what would Ron Cobb do? And if you don't know who Ron Cobb mm -hmm. is, he started with Dark Star, John Carver's Dark Star, he did Alien, and Conan's one of the most famous movies that he did these monumental things, but his influence. He went more than drawings. He built a world around his drawings. He didn't think of like, oh, I'm just gonna draw this little hammer here. There's a story behind it. And I think that influenced all of more than anything else is he was a storyteller in art. And just one sketch has an entire world behind it. And you know, we don't have the time to do that kind of thing anymore. But it's amazing. You but, try and use some logic, especially what Rick was saying, like what would uh, you know what would the ship do? What would what would the parts be? Oh this was too you know, the yellow paint. Well, you have a story around it, because we're not, it's not just people who have a vision like, oh, this would look pretty. It's like, particularly when you're doing something for a spaceship or something that's functional. And what, I do more creature stuff, but even there, it's like, wasn't a water planet, it's a desert planet. So you try and apply some logic so it doesn't just a weird design, because that stuff, Bill Tippett was an amazing teacher for creatures. All his stuff had a biological uh, logic to it that was earth-based. I mean, he would always put a little pink or red around joints where you know, if you're red blooded, that would be, and then he started going, you want to put a dark blue or a dark green, because it, it, it it's unconscious, but it looks real, as opposed to, I'm just going to make a blue alien that's blue all over, and it's in pink eyes, because I like blue paint. Yeah. So I think a lot of it is applying what we know, and logic, and, and history, of, and biology, and ships, because a starship could be a bubble. I mean, it really could be anything. If you're flying through space, it could just be a sphere with, you know, portals, and, and, but everything that you guys do comes from spaceships, I mean, I don't, from warships and, and particularly jets and things, the panels and all that, because it looks right to us. You know, in other cultures or other planets, it could you know, all be grown out of a petri dish.
But, but it would look weird, and you'd be like, oh, that's not real. Like on, on Trek 4, the alien probe that was basically a toilet paper tube with a hole in it and a ball. A lot of people were, but Neil O'Rourke has sold that. And he was so tired of drawing Star, Star Wars ships with panels and poses and all this. So I remember he came in and he pitched it. He, he literally brought in basically a painted gray toilet paper tube with a little tube that came down and a, a ball painted orange. And he's like, and Nilo's from the Philippines. He's like, okay, don't think I'm crazy. <laughs> Everyone's just kind of looking going. And it had a texture to it. And we're like, how, how big is it supposed to be? Oh, like 10 miles long, look. Do you mind if we sneak in and watch the record? So, why don't you just dive back to Did you get to go? You saw it a different time. I didn't get to go that time. Oh, so, well, so we snuck in, and there's a big soundboard. And there's a window looking at our channel, and there are seats behind it, but there's three chairs under the soundboard. So we can sneak under those chairs and no one would know we're in there. So we're looking out there, we're watching Jerry do his thing, and it's, it's remarkable, because he hears everything. And we go, I want to hear section 13 to 45. Usually they start like you hit a tape recorder in the middle of something very big and bombastic. And he'll you know, point, harps too loud, symbols, I want you to, and it was the most amazing thing I ever seen. And he saw us, he kept figuring it over, he comes and he goes, who are you guys? He goes, we're in the heart department. He goes, come eat the orchestra. So he took us in there, I was like, we're shock, shocked by this. And as we're like, as we come out, we met everybody, and Jerry said hi, we walk out in the other room, and a gentleman walks up to us, he goes, I see you got to meet Jerry, I just want to say hi, I'm Alexander Courage. And I knew it was crazy, man. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen, and because it's perfect, that would never have happened. And so, it was the all moment, and we sing him, we, he was doing first contact, we see the images that ILM had done, and he's putting the music to it. It was un, probably the most amazing awe thing I've ever seen in my life. So, wonderful. wonderful. That's a great story. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, I, you know, in, in my 15 total years of working with the franchise, I mean, there have been so many, you know, great moments of working with, uh, you know, the, the different people on the, on the lot. Um, but one thing is this, is this DNA thread that goes back through my childhood. Okay, I grew up in the 50s when there was nothing in Earth orbit. Okay, and we were watching you know, I was watching on, on a black and white TV, uh, you know, science fiction movies and TV shows and uh, uh, particularly things like the Walt Disney Man in Space films. Okay, you know, Man on the Moon, Mars and Beyond, uh, uh, things like that. And that really got my, my, my head, you know, spinning into, into space tech. Um, well, it turns out that uh, you know, Ward Kimball at Disney was, was uh, you know, a major player in those films. And who was working with him but Bob Justman, who was a producer on the original track and on Next Gen. And I found this out and I ran into Bob on the, you know, walk, walking around the lot one day and I said, hey, you're one of the reasons I became a space artist? <laughs> And we had, you know, we had a good chuckle over it, but, uh, you know, Bob worked with Ward Kimball uh, at Disney, and, uh, you know, things like the Disney films and uh, uh, movies like Destination Moon, Forbidden Planet, and, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, right up through uh, uh, things like Robinson Crusoe on Mars. Uh, and I got to meet George Pal at Paramount, and, you know, just all of these little, events that happened, you know, just just affected me in, in wonderful ways. Mine isn't necessarily Star Trek related, so forgive me. Because um, I've had so many wonderful experiences with Star Trek and the people working on it and uh, that it's uncountable. However, I came out to LA when I was 18 and I went to uh, USC trying to get into film school six times, uh, never got in, uh, dropped out because I ran out of money, and um, I was sort of in a sort of nebulous land. I didn't know what I was going to do, where I was going to go. I, I, I knew I wanted to be in the movie business somehow, um, 
and I, I had nowhere to turn. It, it was sort of a, a, a very dark time for me. In it was around 1986, 1987, around the time that we started hearing about Next Generation. Um, and it turns out, one time when I was going back to visit my folks in Chicago, uh, I was on a plane, and we had a scare. Uh, we took off from LAX, and five minutes later, everything went quiet. They had accidentally shut off the engines. And the, uh, the flight attendants get on the horn, and they say, and they sounded really scared. Uh, they said, ladies and gentlemen, you will find flotation devices underneath your seats. Please put them on. Do not inflate them. And the only thing that went through in my mind was, I wonder how my folks are going to find out that I've died in a plane crash. Yes. And uh, we, we went into a dive to get air through the engine so they could start them up again. And, you know, 10 minutes later, we were okay and everyone applauded and they gave everybody free drinks on the... <laughs> um, but I realized that there's a huge thing that I'm not really afraid of anymore because I've been through it. At that, at that very moment, my life sort of opened up and opportunities started happening. I began working for James Cameron, I, I began, uh, uh, you know, working on the abyss, you know, a, a few months later, and it sort of just started me on a positive path that took away all this sort of negative power that had been building up. And it was very strange. I didn't realize until years later that that was actually a core moment, you know, because you don't know what's happening while you're experiencing it. But that's sort of where my career started. And it's been a it's been a roller coaster ever since. And of course, there's ups and downs with everything. But the fact that that sort of big negative cloud was just released with this, you know, uh, under any other circumstance, would be a horrible experience. It was actually one of the most positive things that happened in my life. So uh, don't be afraid of bad things happening to you because they will change you into someone who can manage those situations. Wow. Uh, yeah. I'm very to each one. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a question for uh, John Eames. Um, why? It's, I don't know why. <laughs> um, it's it's kind of well known you're a big fan of uh, uh, 1950s, 1960s dinner craft in terms of design, and you've noted their inspiration to you. Can you give any examples of uh, of plane designs or things that have uh, been taken from the real world and instilled into your drawings that you kind of directly describe, like, like I took this from this or I was inspired by this to draw it on this way when I made the, the ship. Do you have any, something like that? I'll do this one, it stands out. Um, yeah, I, uh, I grew up in Arizona, we were real close to a place called Luke Air Force Base, and they were transitioning from props to Jets do that whole thing. I'm just fascinated. I played us to the end of the runway every day after school and watch this stuff happen. And um, I was just fascinated by it. And somebody gave me a, a book for Christmas on the B-24 Liberator. And was, you know, you go through all that stuff. And it was super inspirational. And then, you know, Star Trek comes out. And it has, you know, it's based in human futuristic reality that are science fiction. But it's supposed to be our extension of us. And, um, getting interested in the X-Planes and Edwards Air Force Base when we live by that, it just inspired me that, you know, if it is really, if there were really starships, where would their base come from? And it was a figured aviation and that type of thing. And so, I always tried to put in my favorite aircraft, and the F-104 is, uh, that's in everything. Uh, the, the, the course there, the P-40, uh, gentleman, model maker we work with, uh, I think, Greg Jean, he was an enormous aviation fan, and he built all the models for 1941, and he had his big P-40 in there. And so, in a way, I put that in there as a, a howdy to Greg. So there's all the intakes and all that stuff that's a howdy to, to him. And um, it's just fascinating world. And so it, it's always fun to put a little bit of that history in there. And when we were doing Enterprise, uh, we were uh, trying to come up with all kinds of 
backstory. So we consulted Edwards Air Force Base on that stuff. What's, what's the future of this and that? And they would tell us as much as they could and would incorporate that stuff into the drawings to try and tie a reality that hasn't really happened with Edwards yet, but is going. And then when it does, with, uh, the same with Herbert Gann stuff. So you try to tie all these things together so when they do happen and they become part of the culture, you see it in Star Trek. So it has this kind of reality-based fiction to science fiction. So that's where that comes from. All right, thanks. Any more questions? Scott? All right, we have time here. Hey, sir, what's your name? Mark Morris from Champaign, Illinois. I think my question is kind of underwhelming after these really nice responses, but do you guys have any spaceships that are not Star Trek that really wow you? Well, that's a good question. Like, what's your favorite design, you know, other than Star Trek, maybe? I'll go first. I am a huge fan of 2001 a Space Odyssey. Um, I think the, the uh, EVA pods are the best design ever done for sort of realistic space hardware. I mean, obviously, it probably never worked, but it looks like it does, and that's the point. Um, I, I just love these sort of intricacies, the way it moves, the way that, that it's controlled. It seems like it's exactly what they would build. And that's, that's my absolute favorite. Anybody else want to tackle that question? Uh, I'll say 20,000 leagues of the sea in the original mm -hmm. model was from Disney yeah. World. Uh, that great steampunk mm -hmm. uh, beautifully designed iron ship. It just looked like a function uh, as it was designed. It, no frills, but it, 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 it looked like a mid business. The front of that prow could cut through anything. And, uh, the inside it was cushy, rhythmic, rhythmic. Velvet lion salon was beautiful. And the organ? Yeah. I, I want to live on that thing. <laughs> For me, it was the flying sub from Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. I just wanted to ride. I wanted one of those things. And I just thought it was underwater and it could fly like that's the best vehicle ever designed. You know? And I loved that it was yellow. It wasn't dirty or gray or metal. I mean, it was my favorite. That's what I was going to say. We grew up in the 60s, the mega era of TV for kids. So everything Irwin Allen did, we were fans of the Sea View, Flying Sub, the Spindrift, and all of those had their place, but that Jupiter 2, when that came out, I, I couldn't get enough of uh, that thing. And then, you know, the later seasons, wherever they hit it, they had the chariot and the, the flying pod and all that stuff. Just a remarkable ship. And uh, now you get the models of this, you know, the one of those things that just, it, of course it was fake, you know, it was the nice way to turn a flying saucer from the 50s into something in the 60s. And it, it really made a mark. Wonderful show. How about you, Rick? <laughs> yes, Rick. I, I, I have too many to count. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I love the Luna from uh, Destination Moon. Um, but uh, more, more recently, I'm kind of nuts about the Rosamonte. Yeah. <laughs> and I tell people, you know, if if it were if it would have been possible for me to pick up sticks and move to Vancouver, you know, I would have loved to work on the expanse. You know, yeah, something. Yeah. Well, could have been. Anybody else with a question? <laughs> no, that's a good question. Okay. Um, well, you know, uh, we we haven't really talked a lot about. Um, kind of experiences on the lot, and this is one of the things that I think that we wanted to get through, kind of funny stories maybe. Um, you know, I don't know, really know how to prompt you for stuff like that, because it's kind of personal. Um, I'll tell you maybe something like this. Uh, I always hear these stories about like bumping into people in costumes at the commissary, or some famous actor at the commissary. Do you have any weird commissary stories? Like I was just going to get a lunch, and, and then, you know, you ran into a Lawrence Olivier or something. Like that. <laughs> Nothing yeah, like that? that sort of you just go and get your lunch and go like everybody else, huh? Uh -huh. I, I just have a, a, a little memory, because I, I, I got to work on, on the pilot for Voyager. And uh, I had worked on a lot before on, uh, I think, the uh, 
was the Adams Family Values movie after that or before that? I don't remember. It was around the same time. It all melds into one big uh, memory. Um, but the office they put me in uh, for Voyager was the, the art department is up on the second level of uh, like stage eight and nine. And there's a, there's a, a series of, uh, uh, there's the art department there and then down the, the walkway is several uh, other uh, uh, upstairs offices. They put me in one of those and it turns out that it's the same office from Sunset Boulevard where the, where the girl uh, uh, writer and, uh, and uh, the main character, William Holden, yeah, um, hang out. And there, the view, they shot it right there, and the view out that office in, in the movie is the view that I had from my office, because it was my office. So it was, it was really weird and funny, and oh my god, I'm really working in the business, and here I am, and it's been around for years and years, and it's still sitting there, uh, and, you know, like it's never been touched, because it's never been touched. So that's my, that's my fun little connection. The commissary all the time with Leonard, and he was usually the being the dumb girl, you know, like people come up to talk to him. And, but there were other actors, ah, I don't have the salad. Um, <laughs> for me, it was swimming laps in the tank and the Paramount lot. They dug up the parking lot and turned it into what it originally been was a big tank. And so there was, I was in my orange hair and my bathing suit, and I'd go do laps. <laughs> and I asked, can I do laps? I'm like, yeah, just don't get hurt. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just spent, you know, like two weeks just doing laps, thinking this is hilarious that I'm doing laps. Did they keep it fluorinated for you? Yeah, they had to because the actors were in there. You okay. know, they, they kept it, they had big filters on it. And they, they didn't what was it, like re-excavated or yeah, something? Yeah, it had been filled in, turned to the parking lot. And we looked at shooting the tank in Mexico, and there was one in Spain, it was very expensive. And somebody said, you know, we used to have a, in front of the big site that's still there, they used to have a tank in front of that, where they shoot warships and miniatures. And so they looked at the cost of just digging up the asphalt, and it, I guess it was a whole lot cheaper than moving the crew down to Mexico. So they dug it up, and it was a tank for about, I don't know, about eight, eight, 10 weeks because they had to put the whale track in there for the whale. They had to put the bird of prey uh, top there for that scene. And then we had, at one part of the tank, it was 20, 25 feet deep, and that's where they had Bill Shatner go down, and that was Bill. We had the stunt diver, he did it, where you see him go down and manually open the, the doors to the bird of prey. and. Uh, yeah, so that was my like weird story. Like oh, swimming. Right. It's like you had your own swimming pool. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Did one. anybody else use it or just you? No, I was the only one goofy enough to do it. And they all laughed. And I was like, I didn't care. That was a con. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, street code. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so anybody come up with any questions? Yeah, well, okay, well, we're getting ready to uh, roll it up. Because I guess it's about that time. So uh, if there's no more questions, I want to thank our entire panel here. They've been wonderful. Great stories. Congratulations to all of you, and thank you all for attending, and thank you for coming to Wonder Fest. Thank you, Brian. All right, thank you.